Have you ever wondered what lies beneath the avoidant attachment style's very stoic and strong facade when they are left when a relationship ends? In other words, if they are the ones being broken up with. Well, in today's video, we are going to cover exactly that. We will do a deep dive into what the avoidant experiences and more particularly the major four stages they go through if they are the one that gets broken up with in a relationship dynamic. And at the end of this, we'll talk about what to do to heal if you are the avoidant attachment style. So the very first thing that I think is really important to recognize is that avoidant attachment styles are not robots, okay? It doesn't mean they, because they're avoidantly attached, they don't have feelings. They just have this strategic way of coping with their feelings, which is really focused around repression and numbing. And so when you see the avoidant go through a breakup, when they're hurt, if they're the one that's broken up with, which does happen, then they will not only experience these four or five major stages here, but they will have this really unique way of trying to navigate their own feelings. So the first stage is that they will shut down. And it is very common. I've heard this countless times from thousands of individuals at this point through our programs, through past in the past running a, a client-based practice for a very long time. The first stage they will experience is the shutdown stage. I've heard that people will say, I broke up with an avoidant attachment style. I sort of expected to have some sort of closure. And literally, I never heard from them again. It's like they dropped off the face of the earth. They never responded to a single text message. They didn't even try to pick up their belongings. They just dropped off and completely shut down. And in this first stage, we have to really dial in what they're experiencing and why. And the, re the reality of the situation is that an avoidant attachment style, when they get broken up with, the reason they shut down so much is that's their strategy to distance themselves from their own feelings. If you are somebody that makes them feel something and then they associate that they can't have access to you in a relationship or romantic way, they're most comfortable strategy of how to deal with this situation is to push you as far away as possible, basically as the subconscious strategy to push any feelings that would cause them heartache as far away as possible. So they will go into this very immediate and very intense shutdown stage. And this will then be a form of repression, right? If they can stay as far away from you as possible, then they don't have to feel, and that's going to be how they manage. I think it's also really important to recognize that avoidant attachment styles never had positive reinforcement, particularly dismissive avoidant, of course, never had positive reinforcement in their childhood compared to the ratio of negative reinforcement that was anything meaningful. And something you have to remember is that the avoidant attachment style in their own childhood, particularly the dismissive avoidant, of course, their ratio of positive to negative reinforcement when it came to emotionally relying on other people for soothing was extremely lopsided. So their experiences of emotionally leaning on somebody else were so far and few between that they had to learn to just adapt to their environment and situation by really learning to rely on self. And so this shutdown or repressing phase is also where they feel a sense of, I know how to handle this. At least I know how to deal with things on my own. That's where I feel comfortable. So it's in their best interest, according to their programming and their coping mechanisms. I'm not saying according to what could be the highest expression of themselves, but it is in their best interest in terms of how they know how to deal with things to keep somebody as far away as possible because that's when they feel the most emotionally safe and protected. So there's that first stage, which is really the shutdown and repression stage. Stage number two is they actually move into this numbing stage, okay? Numbing, and this is something really unique to the dismissive avoidant in particular, this numbing stage is essentially them self-soothing. I think that it gets very easily misconstrued. There's a lot of literature and a lot of information on the internet that says dismissive avoidants are great at self-soothing. 
but that is not true. In fact, that can't be further from the truth. Self-soothing means that I actually know how to make myself feel better by dealing with the situation. A securely attached person self-soothes. They realize, oh, the situation doesn't feel good. I have to set a boundary or I have to communicate a need or I have to work through this, this issue on my own time and, you know, manage my own emotions around it. Dismissive avoidance basically do the opposite of that. It appears on the surface as though they're self-soothing, but they're actually self-numbing. They usually do not go headfirst into a problem and try to work through it. They usually do not get present with themselves and try to make themselves feel better using healthy, nourishing strategies. No, those would be self-soothing. They instead go the opposite direction and they move into self-numbing. And this can be through binge watching television for countless hours. This could be through, um, you know, binge playing video games for hours on end. This could be through excessive drinking, substance use, smoking. I mean, it could be so many different things, but really they're not focusing on anything that makes them feel bad. They are basically trying to distance themselves and numb any feelings associated with it. And this is really that second stage that a dismissal avoidant will go through if they are the ones that get dumped or broken up with. Then they will move into stage number three. And these aren't necessarily completely consecutive stages. These can be happening at once, but generally they start off with that big shutdown and then they move into the numbing very soon after. But those things can be happening again simultaneously as can stage number three, which is flaw finding. They will often convince themselves that they didn't need their ex, that this person wasn't the right person for them in the first place. They will look for flaws and reasons in their mind for why it wouldn't have worked anyways and why they're better off. And they can be, in their mind, very critical about this person. They can tell negative stories about this person. And again, they won't go and like smear the person. They won't usually share these things with others, but this is what they'll do in their own internal reality. And while there may be some truth to why the relationship wouldn't have worked or why there were perhaps incompatibilities, they're really doing this in a flaw-finding manner. And again, this is a subconscious protective mechanism. If I can flaw find and convince myself that there's all these things that are not good about a person, I don't have to hurt so bad. And again, these are very deactivating strategies, which you can see, which is obviously a huge protest behavior of the dismissive avoidant to begin with. Now, we then move into a much more interesting stage, okay? This stage is that they'll move into a space because of doing the first three things, that shutdown, that numbing, that flaw finding. They will eventually, and this is usually quite a while after the the breakup has happened and, and they were broken up with, they will start to gain a sense of certainty and control and even kind of personal empowerment by convincing themselves they don't need anybody. Okay, so this is a consecutive stage from flaw finding. It's not specific to their their ex. It's very specific to them on their own personal journey. And they may at this period of time, you know, say things to themselves like, I, you know, am better off on my own. I don't want to compromise with people. I don't really want to be in a position where I have to commit to something that could change later on. I don't think I'm cut out for relationships. I don't think I'm cut out for romance. It's too much effort. Like these are the types of narratives that they'll then go into their own mind and tell themselves. And this again takes them out of this state of feeling sad that they're and having to numb out that sadness and that grief into this kind of flaw finding where they're in this critical kind of frustrated mode. And actually it moves them emotionally into a state of feeling a better sense of control and empowerment. And it's sort of like they're moving up the emotional scale from a really negative, um, painful space into something that's a little bit more empowered. Now, again, this is not the highest expression of the dismissive avoidant, the highest expression of somebody who's counterdependent, which is part of what a dismissive avoidant is, would be, for example, to learn to work through their feelings, self-soothe, develop emotional bandwidth for the relationship to self and actually be present with what they're feeling and experiencing, work through these concepts and ideas that may be limiting them in multiple areas of life. But if they don't know how to do it, these are the ways that they've learned to cope that obviously have their roots most often than not all the way back in childhood. Just a quick reminder that we are offering a 90-day attachment bootcamp. With this bootcamp, you will receive exclusive access to a personalized roadmap by attachment style that includes a set of video style courses giving you everything you need to know about what it takes to become securely attached. 
These courses will guide you on your journey through video and lesson modules in a lot of detail, along with guided exercises and workbook materials that will help you actually do the work and apply the tools that you need to fast track towards secure attachment. You'll also receive access to our daily live webinars where you can ask questions one-to-one -one with myself and our other trained facilitators, as well as study groups, peer support groups, and access to a private community full of individuals who really care about personal growth, relationships, and emotional connection. This is all a part of the 90 Day Bootcamp, and I will link the description in the box down below if you want to check it out. This brings us to this actual really interesting, I guess we could call this the last stage in a sense. And it's sort of what's actually happening beneath the surface the entire time. Beneath this very stoic facade, they're actually experiencing a form of loneliness, but they hardly ever consciously realize that they are feeling lonely. Now, there's something really interesting here that I want to take you through, this really powerful concept that will hopefully really help make sense of this entire topic. And it's this idea that we have something called our BTEAs, okay? It's our beliefs lead to thoughts, thoughts lead to emotions, emotions lead to actions. So if you can imagine, for example, that I have a core wound, let's say, of I am not good enough. That wound is a belief, right? It's a core belief that I may carry about myself. And again, that would have come from previous experiences in life. When I believe that, that will sort of be like a tree trunk. And if you can imagine as a visual representation coming off of that are the tree branches, which are our T's, B-T, our thoughts. These thoughts will link back to this idea, I'm not good enough. So it may be things like, I'm not interesting enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not all the things that we could tell the stories about ourselves as not being enough. If you then imagine what happens next, BTE for emotions, how do we feel? How do we emote when we're telling ourselves these stories? I'm not good enough. I'm not interesting enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not attractive enough. Well, you could kind of feel insecure or sad or uncomfortable. And neuroscience has actually proven that every single decision we make is based on our emotional state. So even if we're thinking that we make really logical or rational decisions, we actually don't. We just are quick to rationalize the emotionally based decisions through logic. So A is for action. Every action we take is actually based on these first pre-existing beliefs, thoughts, emotions. And here's something really interesting. It doesn't always go in that direct manner, okay? That is the path. But sometimes we can get a deep belief that triggers so automatically that we just feel a certain feeling and go right into coping. We may not even realize that we have these thoughts. As an example, another big core wound for people is I am disrespected. So let's pretend I have an I am disrespected core wound. And let's say my coworker comes along and does something disrespectful, like actually objectively disrespectful, says like something really rude to me. I don't have to start thinking thoughts like those thoughts won't necessarily fester. It won't necessarily go B T E A. Somebody could do something immediately that just triggers that immediate belief. I am disrespected. I don't have to sit there and think, oh, that was disrespectful. They don't respect me. I feel like they're not respecting me as a coworker. I don't actually have to hit that T part on that sequence of events. I can have that belief triggered, go directly into feeling something, and then make a, a, take an action so immediately afterwards that it feels like it's it's synced all the way through. It feels like something happens, and before I even know it, I'm taking an action. And maybe that would be to raise my voice, right? If I hadn't done a lot of work or healing, maybe that would be to cut somebody off or ice them out. Maybe it would be to rebuttal with a lot of passive aggression. Whatever it might be, might be so immediate that it's very quick. Now, the reason I'm telling you this and how this links back to the dismissive avoidant attachment style is that you'll often see dismissive avoidance because they work so hard to repress their emotions and often won't find themselves even being consciously aware of their thoughts. It's almost as if they go from like B to E to, to A so um, automatically. In other words, you'll often see them in a position where they feel hurt by something and they often have this I am alone core wound. But because they're so used to operating that way and they assume that, they may feel loneliness, but they cover up their feelings with their actions much more immediately. So if you look from the outside, this person may not be complaining or expressing feelings or emotions of loneliness or sadness, but you will see in their actions that they're not doing as well. 
Examples being, they are drinking much more than usual. They are chain smoking all of a sudden. They have really extreme workaholism habits all of a sudden where they're just burying themselves in work commitments. And you know that their sense of balance has been disrupted. Or perhaps they are binge watching television every night and staying in and isolating. And in those particular cases, there is this dynamic happening beneath this external facade. And on some level, the avoidant attachment cell often knows that they're not doing so well. And this is where the healing is actually required. If you are in a position, and you can think of this as a person listening, no matter what your attachment style is, if you're in a position where you see that your actions or your habits, your daily life actions or habits, behaviors, we can use those terms all interchangeably here. If you see that these things are some are all of a sudden scattered and you feel like you're doing all of these things in a really unhealthy way. And maybe before you had healthier habits, you would eat cleaner, you would meditate more, you had a good morning routine. And all of a sudden it's like your habits just took a huge nosedive into the trash. And now you find yourself doing all these unhealthy things. That's a sign that you first are feeling some kind of emotion, whether you're consciously aware of it or not, that you are trying to numb out with your actions and you're trying to pleasure seek or escape your way away from as a means for self-soothing. So in dismissive avoidance, even though they may not outwardly or even consciously be experiencing feelings of loneliness, they are in a chronic state often, especially if they're the ones that get dumped in a relationship, of coping through their actions from these pre-existing feelings that they're having. And in this case as well, it may cause them to even further fear commitment and intimacy in future relationships because they're afraid of or unwilling to feel these feelings again. Now, if you are the dismissive avoidant in here, it's so important to question these concepts that, you know, this belief, for example, that emotional closeness will always lead to only pain and, and vulnerability is an exclusively negative thing. Um, it's also important if you see your actions or habits out of alignment to ask yourself, well, when am I my best self? What habits or actions are the best version of me? Is it when I'm exercising? Is it when I'm eating clean? Is it when I'm getting up early? Is it when I am making sure I take time to meditate? Like, what are those things that are the best version of yourself? And if you're even struggling to work down to feeling your emotions and working through those beliefs and thought patterns, you can actually go into a space where you just work through your habits first because that will have a reverse effect on the way that you're feeling, the thoughts that you're having, and then those core beliefs because that BTEA acronym actually works both ways. We can soothe ourselves through our actions that will have an effect on those emotions and thoughts and beliefs, but also we can work through those concepts and belief patterns to have a positive effect on our emotions and actions that will follow. So if you want to do a deeper dive into this topic fully for free, we actually have a course all about belief reprogramming. It's called the Emotional Mastery Course. It's how to get in touch with your emotions, how to work through the painful concepts that may be causing you to feel negative emotions, and really how to master your emotional state as a whole through deeply understanding the relationship between your emotions, your needs, and your beliefs, as well as your actions. So um, you can check that out. I'll put a link down below. Um, that actually will give you a link to our entire personal development school. Um, and you can check that all out down below just for a limited time. That's it for this video for today. Thank you so much for stopping by and for watching. If you enjoyed this, please like, share, and subscribe. And I can't wait to see you in the next one.